Hey everyone, this is Ian Carlin. Uh, you are listening to the podcast in which traditional and modern martial arts collide. That is the Empty Cup podcast. And I am here via Google Hangouts with Paul S. Lewis. How are you doing, Paul? Doing good. Thanks for having me on board here. We finally oh, got man. to get this technology to work for us today. <laughs> it's been a, it's a been... great thing when it works. Right, yeah, it's a it's a great thing when it works, and it's a pain in the ass when it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, this is a show. A lot of people don't know this, but this is a show that I've wanted to do for quite a while. Actually, almost since I started this podcast about seven months ago, and started like looking up other JKD people online and oh. getting to know the wider JKD family. Uh, you were one of the people who came up almost immediately because if you want to know. If your Jeet Kune Do is good enough, we are talking to the right guy. Because wow. <laughs> you run. I don't know who you've been talking to, but uh, make sure you pat them on the back for me and send them a Christmas card. <laughs> you run uh, probably, and we're going to talk about this today, but you run uh, probably the only like JKD, uh, and you call it the International JKD Comparison. But basically, it's like a competition, but. It's a little bit different. You're going to talk about some of the differences and all that stuff. But as far as JKD versus JKD, uh, you're the only like, you know, legitimate place that I know of where that happens other, si other than inside like, you know, uh, particular, you know, martial arts studios. So you actually run an international thing where JKD competitors can get together and find out what their skill level is. Is that right? Yeah, uh, I don't like to say JKD versus JKD because we, we don't want to have that, that stigma attached to us. But uh, and, and we talked uh, off, off air a, a moment about the, the, the title being the word comparison uh, at the end of it, meaning uh, uh, it, we're, we're just getting together. We are competing in technical terms, but we're really just comparing our skills for the benefit of one another. Mm. Sharing is what we're really looking for. Okay. However, um, if you call it something like that, there's a little less interest. When you put a thousand dollars at stake for the grand prize, it there's a little competitive nature, of course. <laughs> we want to see a little of that. Yeah, we, we want to see attached to a stigma that's negative. Right. And we'll go. We're going to go into uh, some of the the different ways that they spar in this uh, com in this comparison uh, thing. But first. We want to know a little bit more about you, and I know my audience wants to know a little bit more, more about you. So let's get into your story. I want to hear about how you got into martial arts in general and how you found your way into Jeet Kune Do. Well, originally I was a kid, but I wasn't uh, a very disciplined kid. Uh, there were five of us children in the house that I grew up in, and I was uh, the last boy out of mm. three. So uh, I was a little, little rebellious by the time I started getting uh, uh, to a certain stature of physicality and you know, be able to run and get on my bike and take off. And my parents uh, couldn't reprimand me anymore because it no longer hurt my bottom when they smacked me. So, uh, so I, I was out doing things all the time, staying out pretty late at night for just a kid. Uh, I guess I was uh, 12, 13 when I first uh, saw uh, the movie Billy Jack starring Tom Laughlin. So way before I knew who Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan or anybody else was, uh, I found uh, a lot of uh, inspiration from that movie uh, uh, for various reasons. One, it was an English uh, Western production, speaking English, not dubbed. Uh, mm -hmm. The lead character Tom Laughlin was super cool, you know, in my in my uh, my view, and the martial arts team. were realistic. So. Right. Uh, it was kind of campy in some ways because of the time when it came out. So the, the hippie era, I guess you might say, uh, the 70s, uh, early 70s. That was like 1971. So uh, when I saw that, it just blew my mind. And I, I didn't know what kind of martial arts it was, but I just started playing martial arts with my friends. We were no longer uh, just throwing punches. We were jumping. We were kicking. We were rolling. We were doing things instinctively uh, off of that. And also, you know, of course, the 60s Batman series, uh, man, all the fighting and the pow and the boom and the bash, all that kind of stuff really caught me. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't until much later until I actually uh, was, uh, I had a job. I worked in fast food as a little, as, let's see, I was 15 and a half, 16, I lied. 
about my age. So I had a few bucks and I took some local judo, kempo karate, uh, various martial arts that were available. Back then, uh, there was no uh, franchise martial arts on every street corner like there is today. So you, I had to ride my bike up, upwards to 15 miles uh, to find a source. So originally, my first uh, inspiration was Tom Laughlin and the movie Billy Jack. Later on, I discovered Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan and all the rest. Right on, right on. And then uh, how about how old were you when you started with Jeet Kune Do? Oh, gosh, I w it wasn't until later. It was, till, let's see, uh, 30. I think it was 30 before I finally found a legitimate direct source. Uh, the first mm -hmm. uh, actual Jeet Kune Do, I, I say actual because I did dabble a little bit with it, but um, they were indirect lineages. But the, the first direct lineage, I should say, was through PFS and Paul Brunak and Thomas Cruz. That was the first time I actually uh, was exposed firsthand, I, touching hand, with mm -hmm. uh, a Jeet Kune Do entity that was reputable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After that uh, is when I, I moved on and met Larry Hartzell. I actually met him years before and, and attended a seminar or two, but uh, I never realized until later that he was uh, he was here on the West Coast. I thought he was still in uh, South Carolina for many years. Mm -hmm. But he was the one that I wanted to train with all along. Oh, interesting, interesting. All right, well, cool. Okay, so now we know a little bit more about your background. And also, there's something else I wanted to ask you about. And before we get into um, the IJKDC, uh, sure. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the groundwork, because you are part of a JKD movement right now that is developing <laughs> groundwork. That's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know what it's, it's kind of emerging almost it's almost like what is jeet kune do groundwork going to look like you know uh and i know you're 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 into that so could you speak on that a little bit yeah i mean i'm not really aware of any particular movement uh, i'm not sure who you run circles with or talk to you about that but um for me um again uh, going back as a kid uh, a little kid, um, sure, we would throw big swinging slugs, just instinctive caveman punching before I ever got involved with any real boxing or anything else. Uh, but honestly, uh, the, the schoolyard fights at that time that I, uh, that I was a part of, uh, which were kind of frequent when, um, we, when I got into high school, uh, the, the start of my sophomore year, we moved into a, a rougher neighborhood area. Uh, so there was a lot of gang element that I'd never experienced before. And, um, you know, I was always one of those guys that stood my ground, maybe even when I shouldn't have. But, uh, but those earlier schoolyard fights before any training occurred were kind of a, the natural instinct was to grab and, and pull to the ground and get on top and start punching downward, which nowadays in MMA we uh, obviously call a ground and pound. But those fights mm -hmm. were almost all like that. It wasn't until later when training kind of uh, sophisticated uh, my approach. And so when I had an encounter, which I still had several encounters throughout the years, uh, always sticking up for somebody else, it seems, which is honorable, I guess. But uh, but those became more of a stand-up kind of thing. you know. And then also uh, throughout the 80s, before I got involved with the rock and roll bands and kind of uh, uh, stopped training martial arts for about five solid years, uh, those were all stand-up type stuff. So the grappling is kind of an instinctive thing, it seems. Um, it's often said that all fights start uh, stand-up and end up on the ground. It's not literally literally true at all. That was probably said by a, a jiu-jitsu practitioner. I don't know. But right. uh, grappling has always been kind of part of the, the five fingers or the, the, the full hand. In other words, uh, one is footwork, one is kicking, punching, trapping and grappling, sort of like that. Um, mm -hmm. So grappling's always, to me, kind of been something that's always been in the peripheral, but I never really trained uh, formally until uh, I got involved with Brunak a little bit of that because he was involved with Gracie training at the time, but much, much more uh, when I met Larry Hartzell, who, uh, you know, of course, uh, formed and was the president of his own Jin Fan Jeet Kune Do Grappling Association. Um, I guess it was, um, I forget what the, the timeline is right now, it might have been the early 90s when Larry got in a severe accident, a car accident, and uh, had to have a hip replacement. So he could no longer do the fancy high kicks that he was accustomed to doing when he was training with Bruce and things like that, also when, during his tempo. But uh, uh, so it was discussed, I, I imagine, between him and his best friend, Grodan Asano, that he would 
uh, pursue more of the grappling, which he already had a judo black belt and had some experience in. So uh, Larry was very advanced uh, with his grappling when I came on board with him. And so that really sparked my interest. And as I got older, when I hit 40 and, and above 40, uh, I noticed that, you know, certain aspects of my stand-up down by nature, you know, age sets in, especially in my later 40s. Uh, so it was uh, a refocus uh, that I would uh, train more and more in grappling. That's when Larry, uh, let's see, about 2003, uh, maybe 2004, uh, introduced me to Gene LaBelle, formally introduced me, I'd met him before. Uh, and to Gokar Chivichin, who uh, to me are really amazing grapplers, and probably the best there is. And so I mm -hmm. became a, a family student uh, there at High Stand, go go with them. And especially after Larry passed away, uh, I really, really uh, reinvigorated my devotion to training with Gene and Gokar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, do you think do you, do you think that there will be a um, like I, I shouldn't say a style because you know Jake Hitty is you know, that's a big discussion anyway you know whether or not it's a style or not a style yeah. but quite honestly do you think there'll be aspects you know of uh, that will make it unique um, from other grappling arts do you think there'll be like a JKD type grappling art yeah well I mean that, again that's kind of a vague thing um, hard to answer really it, it depends on the individual. What I encounter is, uh, depending on what camp, what instructor you're under, they either do what they call original JKD, which <clears throat> the term they use, meaning mm -hmm. the, uh, the stuff that Bruce taught uh, here in Southern California, they're probably mainly referring to the, the Chinatown Fulham. They call it original Jeet Kune Do. But they seem to not do any particular grappling in those classes. They probably mm -hmm. do as individuals decide to seek out different grappling sources, whether it be jiu-jitsu or whatever, uh, outside of those particular Jeet Kune Do camps. But Larry uh, and, and the Asano Academy, where I got the majority of my Jeet Kune Do training, they always incorporated some form of grappling in it. Um, Larry especially, you know, uh, mm -hmm. he didn't really segregate it particularly, but he would give you, this is, uh, we're going to do some grappling. His Jeet Kune Do grappling consisted of maybe a blend of you know, Greco-Roman wrestling, catches can, shooto or shoot fighting, uh, jiu-jitsu, and Russian sambo. So um, when I went for mainly my private lessons, I, I took the majority of private lessons with Larry for all those years. Uh, we would do segments of this and segments of that, and grappling was never discussed so much as uh, outside of Jeet Kune So, mm -hmm. But it's not, not necessarily the case with other instructors or other camps. It's right. just... What you prefer and what you're looking for, whatever suits you. I don't make politics about it. That's good. That's good. It's good to stay away from. I have to stay away from the politics altogether. Yeah, I, I don't listen to. That. I listen to people on politics, you know, because I got I got lots of friends who you know are in all different phases of JKD, and it's cool with me. And it's kind of weird because I feel like I kind of skipped that because of my JK. Because you know, a lot of people know that my channel is Ronin JKD, and there's a whole reason for that. But I just I skipped it yeah, all together. Oh, I get the samurai reference. Then. Yes. <laughs> well, I was abandoned. You know, I did JKD for two years with an instructor, and then he moved, and, and there was no other JKD in this town. So, I did uh, Wing Chun and um, other stuff, and but my people on the channel are very fitting. Yes. <laughs> Often that, I felt that way too during my competitive years in my youth. Um, you know, I was kind of like the Mike Tyson's type. Uh, I I wore just basically black or no, no insignias no camps no uh, logos i just went in kind of uh, unaffiliated you know mm -hmm. right 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 well okay let's i because this is well, this is really fascinating to me yes <laughs> Sorry. very much so very much so no that's okay but this is fascinating fascinating yeah. to me about this uh international jkd um, comparison and I'll tell you what I mean I'm, I, I'm serious man when I my view when I start getting you know millions of downloads you know and I start going into the Joe Rogan era of the <laughs> Ronan JKD podcast then uh, then I'm definitely gonna be able to afford to fly out there and, and do that but uh, it's, until it's then, relatively inexpensive right now because I just came back from Washington and Oregon doing a series of seminars 
And um, there's, a, I think it's called Allegiant Airline, giving really yeah. good deals, like I think 50, 60 bucks or something like that. Oh, wow. So, wow. Okay. Well, I'll stay at your house then. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd be welcome. <laughs> More okay. Okay. I got room. Uh, okay. All right, man. It's a deal. Invite over, buddy. <laughs> okay. Um, so tell me, uh, so t tell, let's, let's talk about it and let's talk about like how it sure. started. Like what, what we know you're the, how this become your brainchild. Uh, so yeah. anywhere you want to start though, but I want to know how it started. I want to know that. And I want to know about the, th cause I know there's three different levels of competition. So uh, not, not so much three levels. We'll get into that, but the, the, the spark for it all, the nucleus happened, uh, during one of my uh, many private lessons over at the Osano Academy with uh, Larry Hartzell. And, um, you know, I, I think he maybe appreciated, I didn't ask him about all the, all the, all the uh, typical questions about you know, what was Bruce Lee like and stuff like that. I, I always wanted to learn more about my instructor. Uh, mm -hmm. So I asked him questions about him and what got him started. Sort of the same thing you're asking me now. Uh, he did mention during one of those conversations that I think it was maybe 1969, uh, before Bruce went over to Hong Kong to make all his movies, uh, Bruce was talking to Larry about uh, possibly starting his own promotion, which was sort of a similar thing as to what we're talking about with the IJK DC event. Um, I don't think it was specifically or, or precisely designed the way I've configured it, but um, basically it was going through uh, you know the different ranges of fighting, free form sparring, no point sparring, which was common during that time in, in a lot of the karate competitions. And uh, bottom line was Larry told me that Bruce did mention that if he did uh, kick this thing off back then, that Larry would be one of his representative fighters. So I started thinking about that and how neat that would be if there was a public platform, a viable uh, resource for, uh, for Jikin Do practitioners uh, at the time, specifically JKD guys, um, to gather together, perhaps once a year and do this sort of thing. But there really wasn't. And to my knowledge, there might be a few entities that are putting something similar together, but I can guarantee it's not uh, what we're doing exactly. And I've, I've spent a lot of hours. Uh, it's been four years now. This is going to be our fourth year coming up on Saturday, September 23rd in Orange, California, a really nice venue that's just laid out perfect for the three segments that we'll get into called House of Gyms, so it's in Orange, California. Anyways, um, so this is our fourth year. We've kind of had uh, three previous years to kind of work out all the bugs, which has been kind of a, a headache to a degree because uh, you maybe think of all, think you're thinking of all the bases being covered, but then once you have it in action, you find, oh, darn, I, I should have thought of that too. So um, last year, we really scaled it down into a small private dojo uh, and it was really cramped and it was kind of tough to, to uh, keep the, the event flowing being that we only had one floor for the activity. And uh, <laughs> I, I had uh, several uh, individuals that had uh, obligated themselves to training, pre-training uh, as, as officials and things like that, timekeepers, scorekeepers. And uh, only, i like, say, I think uh, two of them showed up the day of the show, which was really a bummer. So we left a uh, scrambling to pull people out of the, a crowd to help us out and they had no experience it was kind of a, a administrative nightmare the fights were cool uh, all that was cool we had uh, plenty of uh, registrants so that was cool but uh, it just wasn't what I hoped it would be by scaling it down last year this year we're going all out we have a, the big venue I mentioned we have three different separate sections where we could have the three different segments going on simultaneously so that they won't drag on and also we've got uh, uh, you know uh, I, I want to say professional uh, officials, or we have uh, experienced officials helping us out as volunteers this year. So it should go a lot better. I mean, I'm keeping my fingers. Oh, you froze up on me, buddy. I don't know what happened here. You're, uh, you might have to redo this. So let's see. Sorry about this, everybody who's listening live. We are having some technical difficulties, so please stand by. Well, I know you're not listening to it live because it's going to be because it's not broadcasting live. I'm recording it. Oh, oh, hey. <laughs> okay, I think you're back. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> you get all that? Okay. No, I I, I lost about. <laughs> well, I'm not going to repeat all that. 
All no, I'm no, saying is like about to be a lot better. Yeah, this yeah. year that's basically where we were at. <laughs> it's going to be awesome, a lot better awesome. this year, so that's okay. Yeah, a lot better this year with a bigger venue, um, more staff to help us out, guys that have experience with this sort of thing, and the three sections of the uh, venue are going to help us keep the day flowing uh, at a really nice pace instead of dragging it on like it did last year. Okay. All right. Okay. That that is awesome. So now let's so now get into the three levels or the three, three different types. Three segments. Yeah, three yes. segments. So uh, we're doing three segments. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. Well, there's one main reason why we're doing this is uh, because of the uniqueness of segment one. We call it "Enter the Dragging Asking Hands Face Off." So basically, it just harkens back to "Enter the Dragon," the movie. And you remember them being out on the tournament field on Hans Island, and they do the uh, asking hands or the high reference cross wrists. Yes, and I then do. they do a, You know, everybody, every fan knows. Um, so they'll do this lightning fast uh, striking uh, with uh, non detachment, meaning they have to be touching. They, if they detach for more than a second, then we're going to stop and restart. So mm -hmm. you can only get points through decisive striking. And uh, it, it's quite exciting. I mean, it goes off like dynamite. Uh, we had a, a, a little, uh, we call it oversight, or yeah, we, we didn't think of one thing that happened last year where some of the guys were just whipping, like touching with their fingers and then ducking out real quick. We're no longer going to allow uh, that kind of game of tag. It has to be a decisive strike. You know? So uh, the first segment is just really fast inside trapping range. Uh, that's the only segment that's going to be a kind of a stop and start affair where we're going to go from right lead to left lead, back to right lead. That's two out of three. The second so, segment is – go ahead. Yeah. Wait. What, so um, can you can you, um, can you you attach other hand? So would that yes. still count? So, if I, let's, for example, if I come with a, with a man sow and I come around with a jow sow, but I, I pop yeah. that front hand so that I'm still attached. Yes. So does that count? Exactly. Okay. You got it. Uh, guys that do Wing Chun, Jeet Kune Do, or just about any form of striking will catch on to this pretty quick. If they don't okay. have JKD experience or Wing Chun experience, it takes you know, like an hour workshop to get them mm -hmm. going. And uh, So we've done a couple mm -hmm. of the workshops to help some uh, non-JKD Wing Chun guys into it, and they're really happy about how easy it is to actually learn. The real, the real so, hard part is actually uh, uh, officia, officia, officiating. <laughs> refereeing that kind of thing because it happens so fast you have to have uh, really clear eyes on the action so what about uh, rear hand strikes as long as you stay connected so if i yeah. stay connected and i give a, right. a strike with the rear hand or a kick that's that's legal kick, kicks are no points they only constitute a restart so we're looking for the hand action okay uh, you know it's a lot of head hunting going on but you can punch to the body anywhere really uh, but <clears throat> we wanted to uh, isolate the hand strike more okay and uh, if you do the kick, you're seeing a lot of detachment we have found. Not mm -hmm. always, but too often. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, let's say I go up against you. Uh, maybe I have a uh, Tan Sao, I'm going, I'm going Wu Sao, I go Pak Sao, I go Da. Uh, but I, uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I win that first point. When we reverse leads, go to the left lead on the second face off, uh, you're wary of this. You've already seen my hands beating and go, hmm. I'm just, no, my head's not there right now. I'm too nervous. My heart's pounding too much. So I may throw a low kick at you just to, uh, to restart it. So I can have a minute, to get my head clear, get back mm -hmm. into uh, my fighting mentality and calm down. So uh, that's the only reason you would uh, constitute a kick in the segment one. Does that make Does sense? it ever turn into chi sao? Oh, yeah, yeah. Does it ever turn into chi sao? Uh, <laughs> no, because uh, in chi sao, you're not really striking. You want to get the immediate strike. We've not seen it turn into Chi Sao thus far. Mm. It's usually a Tan Sao, Wu Sao kind of start, usually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, somebody might tie somebody up, might throw the Bong Sao. Who knows what they might throw? Uh, just just mm. cut parry, get it out of their face. And as long as they're not detached for more than a second, a full second or two seconds, and mm. they're rapidly continuing their forward attack. Uh, then it's good. It's good to go. You'll be surprised how, how exciting it is, how the adrenaline gets pumping when you see this happening. Because it's kind of unique. You don't really see it outside so far. You don't see it too much outside of small groups or the movie Enter the Dragon. Right, right. Well, that sounds exciting. It's really fun. Yeah. 
I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's like that. You know? I don't yeah, know if that I'm sure. translates over the video. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think everybody can picture that. Right? Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And yeah, moving on to the second segment. Uh, the okay. second segment's all basically stand up. So any form of kickboxing, Muay Thai, any kind of stand up kicking and striking uh, methods are, are are accepted. Uh, you know, we're trying to keep it safe so that way we're not uh, overly regulated. So there is a uh, protective gear required. Uh, we recommend or provide uh, loaners if uh, some of the individuals can't travel with all that gear. I mean, we have a guy coming from Norway and Georgia and different parts of the country, and you know it is international. So uh, some of the some of the equipment is kind of bulky, or maybe it's not going to be allowed to be uh, uh, stored in luggage. I don't know, but we do have a, a good supply of loaners uh, as far as the protective equipment that we require. We recommend. So that's one. Mean, that's one aspect. Uh, what are we required? Is that what you said? Yeah. 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 So um, they are required to have uh, protective headgear. We do recommend the uh, face mask type, whether it be a screen, the bars, or, or the clear plastic. Um, you know, we don't really want anybody going home with broken noses and split lips and black eyes, if possible. Um, they, uh, there will be a vendor. I understand there's going to be a vendor uh, there that can supply uh, you know, equipment if they want to buy their own personal equipment. But we do have the loaners. And we are uh, in the second segment, especially uh, requiring the abdomen protector, which we also have loaners. Uh, typical uh, Muay Thai or MMA shin guards for segment one, the MMA light gauge gloves are cool. The open palm, open fingers are fine. But for segment two, we're asking if they can get the uh, at least 10 ounce boxing gloves. And again, we have loaners of all this stuff. So cup, mm -hmm. mouthpiece for ma uh, cup for males, mouthpiece for everybody. Um, you know, try to keep it as safe as possible. It is uh, uh, essentially was designed as an amateur type of, of an event, but we do have guys that have advanced experience coming in, uh, mostly beginner and intermediate, but we want to keep it safe. We want to uh, keep the insurance cost to a manageable uh, degree at this stage in the game. In the future, you never know what might happen. It might, this thing might happen. Uh, in a cage or a boxing ring or what? We we don't really anticipate that far ahead. We're just trying to further develop it stage by stage. Uh, so third on, segment on is one, traveling. What, yeah. What, so third on this segment. One, how do you oh, how do you evaluate it? How do you evaluate who won? Uh, okay. Well, you know, again, the third segment is all grappling, right? So within okay. a five minute round, the first submission wins. There's there's a uh, we call it dead heat rounds as well if there's no clear submission. But all in all, we have a specialized scorecard that the judges will have. They'll be like sort of like mat side, ring side judges, as you might want to refer to them. And uh, there's a scoring method. And uh, so at the end of the whole thing, uh, when, when each initial matchup, which we're trying to keep very fair by initially matching up you know, weight class and experience as much as possible uh, until there can only be one at the end. So each of the winners of each of these specific weight classes or categories is going to have to face off with each other. It's almost uh, like an all in at the end if you want to go for the $1,000. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. I'm not sure yeah. I'm following you for so the <laughs> second the second part though is stand up, right? You said it's stand yes. up detached. So how yes. does how do you how do you score that? Is it just point sparring or just, is it just yeah, yes, just like no, not not strictly, but there are points being counted for every strike. If you okay. get a TKO or you know an unfortunate KO, I mean that is what it is. Uh, but uh, but it is a accumulation of strikes and points and obvious uh, determinations, which is okay. common in any kind of a kickboxing match. I mean, in a kickboxing Muay Thai, whatever you want, whatever you want to refer to, um, there's either you know a KO, a TKO, or a scorecard. So do do the participants have to? Um, um, Participate on all levels. Can somebody just go? Hey, I just wanted to do the touch hands. Right. The uh, yes, they can do one, two, or all three if they want to go for the thousand dollar grand prize. You have to do all three to do the the grand prize. But there'll be lesser yes. awards and medals and things like that for individual segments as well. There are guys that just do grappling. They're a jiu jitsu guy. They don't, they don't know anything about stand up. They're not interested in asking hands, but they're uh, registered to to roll for some oh, okay. three. And then uh, same thing with some of the strikers too. Some some of the Wing Chun guys are coming in. They don't want to 
mix it up in full complex sparring, but they really are interested in the uh, asking hand segment. So okay. it's up to the individual registrant. So far this year, um, uh, miraculously, the majority of uh, registrants are going for all three. They're going for the $1,000. There's even guys that uh, maybe they're used to doing stand-up. They roll a little bit. They, they do a little bit of grappling. But my encouragement is just try all three. Uh, one, you're paying $25 regardless. You know, So it's $25, very low registration fee. Uh, and you have the a choice of doing one, two, or all three. Okay. So uh, what we've seen in past years, we've seen a guy, uh, I had a student last year that only had about four months of experience with me, uh, but he ended up uh, taking heavyweight, uh, the heavyweight uh, first place, just because various reasons. One, uh, uh, perhaps the, the guy that he goes up against uh, in the end uh, has already kind of petered out from expending too much energy in the first two segments. So he took advantage of that because he had uh, the cardio to to uh, to win. So uh, if you're there and you've done a little bit of everything or a lot of everything or whatever, you're paying $25, anything can happen, uh, might as well go for all three. And you might have right. a chance of winning $1,000. You might walk out of there with a grand and go, geez, I didn't even think I could do that. So that's right. the really right. neat thing about the variables. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, so yeah, tell me a little yeah. bit about the grappling um, rules. Do you allow like heel hooks and leg locks? Is it gi, no yes. gi? Uh, preferably no gi, just so we kind of uh, even it all out. I think if one person is wearing a gi, he may or may not have an advantage. Um, it's, it is a no gi event. Yeah, no gi grappling. Okay. And it, it, uh, some of the rules, uh, the rules are very much like uh, what I see Gokurtovich in doing. With his highest stand grappling challenges, uh, it starts in stand up, no no striking. But you're standing up, sort of like a judo match or you know, maybe a wrestling match at times, uh, or jujitsu match. You, you come in, you face each other, you uh, entangle, you know, you, you engage into a tie up of some sort. Whether you trip, throw immediately, whether you uh, uh, do have a stand up uh, submission or want to take your opponent down. And buy for a, uh, a compound submission, you might call it. Uh, you could do it any which way you want. It, anything from jujitsu, zombo, catch as can, Greco, any kind of grappling is, is allowed. But you have a five minute round and you need to get the submission to win. Okay, that's cool. That's submission cool. only is the, the way I like it anyway. Um, well, uh, you and I have both experienced uh, some losses in the last little while. Uh, your your loss has been a little bit more across the board. More people know about it, um, and you know my loss has been you know more personal. You know with uh, my my JKD instructor right. leaving. Um, Sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah. He uh, so my my instructor died just like a few months ago. The guy who taught me JKD. And then his instructor died wow. like a couple of years ago. So like it's, a, it, it, it's a, yeah, Steve. So we're, we've got nobody from us to Steve Johnson. Steve Johnson's our link to Bruce Lee. Right, right. Um, so, but you have actually had a chance to work with uh, some top name people who you were close to and it kind of shook the, the JKD world. Um, and, uh, I know, I know you wanted to have an opportunity to speak about that and your time with those people. So sure. feel free, feel free to well, talk yeah, about yeah. that. No, I, I, I would, uh, I would say that, you know, it's been an honor and a privilege to, uh, be able to have the chance to train with, I also, maybe you don't realize, I don't know if, I think you do, but I've also had two losses as far as our, my chief instructor, uh, Larry Hart's up passing away. Yeah, uh, ten years now. Uh, if it wasn't yeah. for him, I really would not not uh, learned as much as uh, as I have, or uh, the fire wouldn't be as burning as hot, uh, the eternal flame. If it wasn't for Larry Hartzell, I owe everything to Larry Hartzell, my chief Jiu yeah. instructor, uh, of which I'm a senior instructor under him, uh, the Jin Fun Jiu Jitsu Grappling Association. But uh, I, I, I've had time to uh, get over that now, uh, not get over it, but just come to terms with uh, a loss. Uh, but more recently, uh, Richard Bastille, who was one of my instructors 
for a, a few years as well. Right. Uh, very, very beloved. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, just highly revered in the Jeet Kune Do community. Really great, great guy with a fantastic sense of humor, very personable, uh, left behind quite a large legacy uh, for us all to uh, appreciate. So, uh, yeah, I was at the, uh, the services uh, in Carson uh, earlier this year. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was an emotional thing for everybody involved, quite a big turnout. We saw Linda Lee and uh, Shannon Lee there, as well as just it was a virtual who's who of Jeet Kune Do there, as well as the martial arts entire martial martial arts community and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was a big loss. Uh, IMB is a great place to train in Torrance, California. Uh, a wonderful facility with great people. The Ohana there, as we call it. The the, the people there, the friends, the family there are, are really tight knit. Uh, I do regret that I, I haven't really trained there in years now because I've moved on to some other interests that I have. Also, my schedule had changed at one point. So uh, I still would attend many of the seminars that uh, C.P. Bustillo would put on, but I haven't been an, a member for a few years now. Uh, so I, I do regret not being able to spend even more time with them. Uh, if anybody had foresight that this kind of thing would happen, of course, they would uh, try to try to be closer. Uh, but uh, regardless of that, you know, the heart's in the right place. And I really value all of the time that I did spend there and uh, the relationship that uh, I was able to, to uh, uh, establish with uh, Sifu Bastille. So he's going to be sorely missed, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's, been a, there's been lots of losses yeah. in the JKD community. And uh, unfortunately, we're all getting older, you know. Yeah, you we're know, gonna... right. There has been... Uh, uh, one after another because they are kind of getting uh, into the, that age where uh, you know you just don't mm -hmm. know who's going going to be gone next uh, it's a sad thing that the uh, the first generation original students of Bruce Lee uh, you know that the reality is set in that uh, you know they're going to be gone uh, and uh, there's another generation coming up but you know uh, being humble about it all uh, it's like a story I tell you today, uh, you tell somebody tomorrow, and then they tell somebody, 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 somebody down the chain, and oh, I don't know, a year later, five years later, whatever, at the end of the, the, the chain of uh, translating this story, uh, it comes back around to me full circle, and I'm going, that's not what I said. <laughs> so uh, I think that no matter how uh, devoted you are to your teachers, you just don't uh, have the same uh, story to tell or as, as exact a story to tell as those original first generations. So it's a valuable resource that we're losing and uh, it can never be replaced. We can do our best, no. but it can never be replaced. Yeah. No, it can't be replaced, but you know, thank God we're, you know, it, it's happening in a time of media, you know, where we can um, record a lot of this stuff and, and get it down so we, you know we know what somebody said uh yeah. you know i just think like you know 50 even you know 100 years ago 75 years ago you know that generation of martial artists is largely you know unless it was written down in a book or something like that it was largely lost you know i just think about like like yip man's teacher that's that's the person i would like if i could sit down and talk to anybody uh, and he had two, you know, and maybe the one before that, Loon Jan, because that's really like the, that's really like where we have anything like physical on Wing Chun. You know, after that, it's, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all like legend, you know, it's all, I mean, it's a pretty solid legend, but you know, it's pretty engraved in stone, but it's still like, mm, there are different pieces and you get different Wing Chun groups that say, no, this happened. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, a lot of varying yeah. opinions. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just before that media took place, before we had uh, the ability to film and the ability to, um, you know, record in some way that you know, that actual person telling that actual story, uh, it's it's you know it's difficult. Those things just get lost, or they just they just you know quite honestly they get distorted. Yeah, you're right. Um, and, and again, we were goofing around earlier about technology and had a little glitch and several moments ago. Uh, 
but the technology really makes the difference. Uh, you know, things from my generation that I had to learn, like I said, ride my bike 15 miles and scrap scramble for uh, money and things like that. Uh, you know, they're, they're hearsay almost now, I guess you might, might say that. Uh, however, uh, in the day and age of, uh, the internet and uh, accessible video like phones. Yeah, uh, right. If only I had that back in Chicago and when I was doing my underground fights and things like that, that'd be yeah. awesome. Or even when I was in the bands, to have more of that available would have been wonderful. Uh, but having that technology now, you can take a guy that uh, starts out at whatever age, maybe the same age I started out, maybe let's just say 15 to 20 years to accumulate this parameter of useful knowledge that I, I've gained by hustle and bustle, you can learn it uh, by watching YouTube. It's, oh yeah, yeah. It's just miraculous uh, to learn what uh, I know. You're 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 not as old as I am, but the same thing with you. You probably did a lot of that same hustle and, and scrambling to uh, proficient instructors. Nowadays, uh, I just go online and I find. Well, you know, this is it's it's so in interesting. Way, I, 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 lived, oh, I lived in a, a time. You're, yeah. You're kind of cutting in out here. Let me. Um, uh, I lived in a time where I. Um, I lived in a time where, where literally, like when I learned Wing Chun, like they would not show me the BG form. They wouldn't. They didn't know until I got to VG. They wouldn't show me the VG form. And now you just you can watch it on on YouTube. You know, there are various yeah. different kinds of of Wing Chun. Watch. But I mean, quite honestly, it was just like it was. Uh, you know, it was before. It really before, like probably right at the advent of 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 being able to to do this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't know what VG looked like. They would close. They would literally close the doors and get all the other students out and practice VG. And this was just like 2003, you know what I mean? 2002, somewhere around there. And now it's just like, there are really no, no more secrets. And then, especially when it happened with my JKD, because I went, you know, I worked with this guy and then he moved. I didn't have videos or YouTube or what. I mean, you actually had to actually buy the VHS tapes, you know, like from Black Belt Magazine, you know, you had, you had people like uh, Paul Vunak and uh, uh, Richard, um, no, uh, uh, Burtonson, uh, Burton Richards. Burton Richards. Yes, he was Great selling. Guy. Yes, he was selling them. Uh, he might be on the show actually. So he, he, I contacted some of his people. Great guy. And I said, they, yeah, he, yeah. It's, I'd love to have him on the show as well. Um, if you know him, you Let know you put in a plug. Good, good word for me. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, uh, uh, there, there's like, something I wanted to make mention of what you're talking about about, uh, and both of us are talking about about the. YouTube and videos. Um, not only can we find uh, whatever it is we're looking for online, uh, especially YouTube, uh, but we can find several resources. It's not like, a, again, the old days where we had the brick and mortar places that we had to go visit, uh, which we still believe we should because touching hands, there's no replacement for that. But right. just for extracurricular, like reading a book or watching videos, you could have uh, more than one book. You could have more than one video. You could have more than one uh, entity posting these videos. So you can get uh, a varying uh, of uh, of uh, input. Yeah. These uh, right uh, resources online right. now. So it really does accelerate today's uh, young, let's say, young martial artists. Uh, as far as advancing at a much more rapid pace, because the 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 knowledge the uh, it's shared more widespread than it ever was in any type point in history. Um, a lot of uh, the cross training that I feel has always been key uh, is now kind of more commonplace, uh, thanks in part to MMA and the UFC. Yeah, because people are now have now learned oh, since the induction of that. Uh, uh, that you you can't just rely on one uh, approach. Mm -hmm. uh, having a multiple or multi approach uh, in cross training uh, is almost key. I think it's very important. In other words, I, I didn't just go. My passion maybe Jeet Kune Do overall, uh, 
Uh, I've cross-trained in other martial arts. I, I've not trained with just one JKD resource. Uh, I sought out uh, additional one. So I think that's what kind of made me, if I, if I can say I'm well-rounded, more well-rounded than I would have been if I had taken that open-minded approach to it all. Right, right, yeah, exactly. I left out the politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, where do you see, um, uh, and this is a question I want to ask you, where do you see IG, I, JKDC in the future? What, what's the future of this? What would you like to see more of, less of? How would you like to see this going? You mean as far as the event or just Jeet Kune Do in general? No, no, as far as I, I JKDC, the actual oh, 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 the oh, event. Yeah. You were cutting out again, I didn't tell you. But anyways, uh, I'd like to see it go on the road. Uh, and not be uh, limited to just Southern California. The reason it's still here is it's got a lot of growing to do. There's still things to work out. Uh, you know, just like when the UFC started out or any, any uh, sport that's originated or anything that's originated, it takes a little time for it to uh, evolve and mature. So um, the reason that we're uh, going back into a large venue this year and advertising it more is because we feel more comp confident that we've reached another uh, plateau in, the, in its development. And this will be the first year that we're gonna allow uh, professional uh, filming of the event. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our special guests, Leo Fong, a very well-known uh, person in martial arts in Jeet Kune Do, a friend of uh, Bruce Lee, uh, he's also a filmmaker. So he's a volunteer to bring his crew down and his cameras down. And so uh, he's gonna uh, do a really good job, I'm sure, of. Uh, of uh, recording the entire event and editing it into a uh, sort of a DVD type of a format. So that way uh, maybe we can use that as a marketing tool to expand it further. So we're really you know, grateful that he's coming down. He's a great guy. He was at our inaugural event at the Long Beach uh, International's 50th anniversary and he did uh, uh, some really great seminars uh, for us there, which was a, a really, really good thing to be a part of. So um, we're really glad that he's coming down and going to help us out with that and take care of the video uh, and the film footage, you know, in a professional manner. That's really cool. I'm, I'll be excited to see that. I will truly yeah, be yeah. excited to see that. So um, uh, tell me a little bit about your training right now. Like, what are you currently working on? I know that probably this event takes a lot of time. But I kind of want to know, like, what still, what still excites you? You know, or is there anything new out there? Like, maybe, like, oh, now I'm, now I'm really getting into knife fighting. Or even, like, maybe I'm t taking a traditional martial art now or something like that. You know, what, what is it that excites you right now? A lot of things. I'm very excitable. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing that I'm sitting here in one spot for so long. He's, I'm fidgeting, I'm doing things. <laughs> uh, but I'm trying to focus on this. And also, uh, you know, we have some delay off and on here with the video, so I want to really pay attention to what you're saying, of course. And I, again, I appreciate this. Um, me personally, in the last uh, few years, uh, I've, I've just become completely fascinated with uh, the deep level Jeet Kune Do approach that uh, one of my instructors, Patrick Strong, has developed. Uh, Patrick Strong is freaking amazing. Uh, Everything that Patrick teaches me is just blows my head, my mind, my head explodes. Uh, Patrick, if you don't know him or have never talked to him, he's a very high intellect, uh, super intelligent, uh, IQ off the charts. But he's very inventive, very creative. And uh, he was another original student of Bruce Lee's from the Seattle group, if you didn't know. Uh, over the past uh, the decades, he's really, really, in my opinion, come into uh, a very unique uh, entity with a very uh, original approach to his Jeet Kune Do training. So I'm very lucky that uh, I've become one of his private students. Uh, uh, but I, unfortunately, I, uh, in recent times, because of my schedule change and I'm now teaching at a new gym over here in, uh, nearby in Westminster, California, uh, my week is pretty packed with a lot of other uh, responsibilities that I need to take care of. So I, I slacked off on my training with Patrick, but I still keep in touch. He's super busy as well. He's developing a unique product uh, that I, I really can't, uh, I can't speak of right now. Uh, he, okay. he will announce it formally when he's ready, but it's just really, really unique, never seen before uh, 
uh, I want to, for lack of better words, call it a device or coupled with a method to develop uh, extreme speed uh, and convergence of power for punching. But again, I think you should get Patrick Strong on the show and let him talk oh, more I, about that. I would love to. That's it further. But, I would uh, love to. Patrick is amazing. That's all I tell you right now. I, Okay. He's just taken uh, what I what I already knew and accelerated into a deeper. Uh, uh, gosh, you know how do I describe it? Get Patrick on the show. Uh, I would definitely make a recommendation for that. He's very uh, very different from anybody else I've ever trained with as well. His chicken do goes to a different level in, in many aspects that. Um, it almost defies description, but once you experience it, you just your jaw will just drop. Okay. I'm still on. I just cut out my camera. I'm hoping that. Yeah, yeah, I see that now. Yeah. I'm hoping that it'll it will um, um, make the audio a little bit better. Ah, it stops so exactly. I, Yeah, the camera sometimes slow it down. Gets you know <laughs> the bandwidth. Okay. So okay, uh, I will definitely look him up, and I will drop your name. Uh, you know, so if he contacts you and asks you about me, you can say, yeah, I, I, I was on the guy's show. I can say he's um, not too pretty on video, so <laughs> the video turned off like, like it is now. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, last, last question, and I want to give you a chance to tell people where to find you um, online. But uh, last question, this is what I ask all my, all my guests, and that is what are your three top three fighting tips and or training methods to pass on to the wow. listeners. To limit it to three is really difficult. If you um, had to pick the top three, I know. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, there's, there's a couple of things that I teach uh, at my seminars. Uh, uh, I, I just taught this. Uh, it's a very simple thing to, to, uh, to translate, but a very, uh, difficult thing for you to uh, to consciously uh, allow uh, to accept and then eventually become into subconscious which is really that state uh, of it's doing it all by itself that we talked about uh, I just I just taught a group uh, an open group uh, last week up in uh, Spokane Washington a very nice group of people uh, never heard of me before uh, maybe knew a little bit about Jeet Kune Do, but were interested uh, and so open-minded. And this is the first thing that I taught them, as I did with the remain the additional seminars I did in the state of Washington uh, in Portland. Um, so the first thing I, I like my students to learn is what I call SBC, or okay. Scientific Breath Control. It's a, a, not a natural way for the you've been uh, to to approach breathing mm -hmm. but uh, but it is a call it an advanced way for lack of a better term or appropriate term and uh, so one thing that I would like everybody to learn about if they become involved with me or they come to touch hands or, or, or attend one of my seminars is SBC uh, I'm not gonna uh, re reveal it and I'm sorry <laughs> Uh, here online because I don't think it's something that I would pass along to people uh, unless they're uh, you know here with me in person or with me in person. Um, I need to show you rather than tell you about it. But SVC is something that I think will uh, help everybody. Well, I know okay. it, it's it's a valuable uh, asset. Uh, it enhances cardio and allows the body to become a, a true coolant system. Mm. So uh, it, it'll uh, help you to last longer, go farther, uh, work harder without uh, fatigue setting in uh, as quick as it might uh, do to everybody out there at this time. Uh, everybody's cardio is different. You know, a lot of it due to age and different aspects of cardio training. But this will be like an equalizer or a, a handicapper, a crutch okay. to help you go further. So SBC, Scientific Breath Control. Uh, come see me and train with me or attend one of my seminars uh, and I will teach you this right off the bat. It's one of those things where people maybe, I mean, maybe they usually don't, but in my head I'm thinking, well, what can I show these nice individuals that have paid to come train or attend one of my seminars? 
that maybe they haven't seen before. And that'll change a lot of what they're doing. And so SVC is number one, uh, worth its weight in gold. Uh, okay. Other than that, uh, there's a lot of the Wu Wei, Wei Wu Wei that I'm very interested in that Patrick Strong has really turned me on to that I, I, I really like to translate or, or, or uh, help people to learn more about. I think it's another equalizer uh, where uh, uh, biomechanics uh, wins out over musculature often. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are those are the, the two of the things that I really uh, really look towards. Uh, the other thing is uh, a grip in grappling. Uh, Gene LaBelle's three finger grip. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I call it the golden grip of Gene LaBelle. It, it's not uncommon if you've done a lot of catch and scan or uh, wrestling and, and grappling, but it's just the best grip there is, and uh, could also uh, withstand. Uh, uh, against uh, strength and other biomechanics uh, uh, versus strength, overall strength. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps a lot of people, especially uh, those that are smaller or uh, maybe maybe females just only because uh, the average male, his musculature and mass is usually a lot greater than the average female. So that grip is really, really good uh, to utilize. So those are three things that uh, I definitely teach almost all the time, especially when I encounter new groups or new individuals that I've never seen it before. But there's a lot more. I mean, everything from your, your training approach, your mental approach, uh, the, uh, the uh, range at which you approach trapping, uh, I often see is not really on the, on the mark. I see a lot of guys are trying to trap from long range, and uh, trapping should be uh, uh, approached at, at close range. Right. So a lot of times when people say that trapping doesn't really work in a real fight, well, they're right because the, the methods that they're training it, there's uh, better methods. Uh, probably a, a, a good Wing Chun uh, instructor will give you uh, a versatile Jeet Kune Do uh, practitioner will be able to teach you as well. So there's a lot of aspects. Uh, you know, There's too many to just limit to just three, but uh, that would be three off the top of my head that maybe uh, I would show, as I mentioned, at a seminar or in front of a new group or a new individual to try to give them something right off the bat. Let's say he's, for whatever reason, financial, whatever distance, he cannot uh, consistently train, say, with me. Uh, I would at least give him those three aspects so that way he could walk away and have uh, something to show elsewhere uh, that is viable. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I agree, agree particularly – the breathing, the breathing aspect. aspect. Really um, unique. Man. Whenever we yeah, get together, I'll show, you, I'll, I'll show okay. it to you and uh, see what you think. I definitely, I definitely, I definitely will. will. It's just, it's a matter of I when. Yeah. Not, <laughs> I hear not a matter of if. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, well, tell everybody how, where they can find you online. Online, yeah, you, know, you can find me on Facebook very easily at uh, Paul, middle initial S, uh, last name Lewis, L E W I S. Uh, from there, you could find my uh, international JKD comparison training group on Facebook and also uh, uh, the Jeet Kune Do Collective uh, that is also on Facebook. Uh, as far as where I'm located, uh, uh, as far as brick and mortar location, uh, I'm, uh, I'm teaching Monday and Wednesday evenings, 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. at David Brock's brand new uh, Extreme Fighters Gym in Westminster, California. Oh, cool. uh, you can find all the information online and easily locate me and uh, communicate with me there. Uh, my email address is amamjkd at gmail.com. That's Apple Mary, Apple Mary, jkd at gmail.com. Uh, you know, I'm pretty responsive to uh, inquiries, messages, and questions. Uh, and I would look forward to uh, meeting new students, new practitioners. That is part of the reason why we've created the International Jeet Kune Do Comparison. Again, comparison going back to uh, the term that was often used when Bruce Lee was a youngster in Hong Kong, when the uh, Junction Street Tiger Gang and all the different gangs would meet on top of the rooftops uh, to fight. They never called it, I'm going to fight you. They said, we're going to compare our gung fu. Or Wing Chun. <laughs> so comparison is a much friendlier term than a tournament, a, a fight, a, a championship. Mm -hmm. So 
So that's that's the key. That's uh, that's what we want. We want to have everybody feeling like they can attend and participate uh, uh, in these events openly. And so right, you want right. To call it a challenge, because then your your uh, defenses go up. Our competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, stay on the line with me. I'm going to close out the show, but after the show, Great. I want to talk with you. So just hang on for just a second. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Empty Cup podcast. If you like what you heard, you know what to do. Share this on your favorite social media and write a review in iTunes. It helps people find the show. And, um, you know, uh, give me a five-star review. I would love that. That would be awesome. I would really appreciate it. And if you want to follow me on Facebook, it's Facebook forward slash the empty cup podcast and i'm on twitter but i don't do a lot but you know i know there are people yeah. out there who like twitter so just at empty cup podcast on twitter but on facebook i'm always i'm always uploading like uh videos and stuff that i think's interesting and quotes that i think are interesting so the place really to find me is on facebook uh and if you're very adventurous you can go over to my youtube channel where you can watch this interview. Um, and you can also watch my couple of sparring matches and my instructional videos on Ronin JKD. That's the name of the channel on YouTube. That's Ronin JKD. Head on over there and subscribe. And until we meet again, keep your gloves up. <laughs>